Hello, this is Asian Movie Pulse Talks number eight. I am Panos Kodzathanasis, and I'm here with Ruben Linars and Tom Wilmot. Today we're going to speak about a very iconic Japanese film, Lady Snowblood. Uh, a film that, I don't know, but personally I think it's one of the films that actually brought me into Japanese cinema when I saw it about, I don't know, probably a little after Lady Snowblood or something like that. Uh, okay, guys, what have you seen Kill Bill, Ruben? Oh yes, I've seen I've seen Kill Bill definitely a couple of times when it was in the cinema. I was a big, big Tarantino Tarantino fan. But I actually, and actually, I mean, we're going to talk about this. Actually, when I saw Kill Bill, it got me started on um, Japanese exploitation. I think it just I think it got me started on Lady Snowblood, and then I watched the whole Sasori films and all the other th all the other films that are that he mentions in this film or his many others. What mm -hmm. about you, Tom? Yeah, so I mean, I saw Kill Bill years ago. I just sort of um, when I was doing like a binge of Tarantino films for like a first time watch, and um, I became aware of Lady Snowblood um, probably like a couple of years after the first time I'd seen it because I was relatively young when I saw it, and um, it's been on my watch list forever. Um, and it's only actually since we got around to doing this exploitation month on Asian movie Post that I finally pulled the trigger and given it a watch. So I'm very fresh seeing it for the first time. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we have to say that Lady Snowblood pays homage to my butt. Kill Bill pays homage to the whole exploitation genre of the 70s and some... Uh, Kung Fu films of the same era, but uh, uh, the film that's actually the film is mostly based on is Lady Snowblood. Tarantino has actually taken up uh, whole scenes and uh, reshot them in with uh, his actors. And I mean, the whole inspiration is quite evident. Also, the main song of uh, Lady Snowblood features in Kill Bill. I don't know, what did you think of those references, Tom? Um, I mean, I, I hadn't really looked into, um, I tried not to find the parallels between the two, even though that I knew that they existed just so that I could kind of see the film with a fresh eye. But I mean, yeah, there are definitely a, a few shots at least, uh, even having not seen Kill Bill in quite a number of years, where you kind of go, oh, that's that's where he's got it from. Um, I I'd see it totally as a homage. I don't think, um, obviously, the similarities in the plot are there um but i still think both movies are completely their own thing and they do kind of complement each other quite nicely actually yeah yeah we did ruben i mean this goes into the uh discussion which i don't want to start but this goes into the discussion whether uh what tom just said whether tarantino is doing his own thing or whether he's just making a tapestry of various references to exploitation and whatever it is um, but it's very much its own thing. And I think one of the many things that Tarantino deserves praise for, apart from um, many of his films, is the fact that he made a whole generation aware of these, uh, of these great, great films that he pays homage to. And as you pointed out, also the music. I think the uh, soundtrack that uh, Michael Kaji or the that uh, made all the way she thinks. It's such a beautiful song and encapsulates so much about what makes Lady Snowblood so special, this mm. melange of violence, beauty. Uh, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of uh, snow and blood as a, as a dichotomy is just a beautiful, mm. uh, just a beautiful um, met metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I guess no matter what you think on Taradino about what you just mentioned, I think we, we should be thankful to him because those films were totally forgotten. But even in Japan, I think no, nobody dealt so much with what happened in the exploitation genre in the 70s. Nobody remembered Meiko Kaji, essentially. That's what I felt. So thank you, Quentin, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so to go into the movie, Ruven, you will tell us a bit about the story. 
Well, I can do, even though I think those people who are watching probably know the story already, but nevertheless, let's uh, start off. Um, it, everything starts in 1874 when um, a young girl named Yuki is Yuki is born in the prison cell, and we get to know a little bit about the background, why her mother ended up in ended up in prison. Her her husband and her son were were killed by a group of let like, group of four people who actually who actually had a mob behind behind them and the mother being pregnant uh, the mother not being pregnant at the time but the mother was the only one who survived and she was set on revenge and wanted to do the revenge herself but um, then she got uh, then she was imprisoned and she and she basically wanted to become pregnant had sex with many many men just for the sole purpose of having a son preferably a son who would who would go on and avenge her but it but things turn out differently and Yuki is born and she is raised and educated her mother dies during the childbirth I think yeah I think yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, she lay and she goes on she's educated by a martial arts professional by a sword uh, fighting master and she, and at the age of 20 so in 1894 she sets out on her revenge seeking out those four individuals who have now become one of them has become rather poor or an alcoholic one of them has become a rather successful businessman or one of them has become a successful businesswoman and she seeks out those individuals to set out on a path of revenge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, at this point, uh, I would like to say, okay, Lady Snowblood is like the, the quintessential exploitation film, like you have mm -hmm. a female prison in there, you have the concept of revenge, you have torture, uh, torture scenes, you have violence, you have uh, martial arts and whatnot, but uh, there is one thing that you don't have so much, which is nudity, a point that, as I know, Meiko Kaji insisted on, which, okay, but okay, this is probably the only element of exploitation that you cannot find in this film. Tom, what do you think? I do, th I do think that's quite a significant omission, though. I mean, um, especially when you compare it to um, the female prison Scorpion series, um, they feel different, even though the exploitation elements are there in Lady Snowblood, like you said, that kind of graphic element, it, it does change it a little bit tonally, at least for me. Um, uh, and I, I feel that it, while it's the quintessential exploitation film in some ways, it doesn't capture the essence of the whole era entirely mainly because that aspect of it is missing, like the nudity and I guess the more graphic sexual element, um, which I'm totally fine with because in some ways I think the movie is better for it and it's sort of eleva elevated a little bit. Yeah, Ruben? I mean, the uh, the whole nudity thing or sexuality adds a sort of sensationalist element to uh, these, ex these exploitation films or many explo exploitation films. Um, even though we said we keep the references to a minimum, I just re I just reviewed Woman Health Song, which somewhat has some similarities to that and uses sexuality in that so in that way. And I and it got me thinking, why is that being omitted in Lady Snowblood? And just what Tom said, I think it makes the Lady Snowblood much, a much better film because it makes the same points about, let's say, patriarchy. The, the system that they live that they live in the period that they live in um, women's uh, uh, sorry men's view on women and and sexuality and I mean they are just the same beasts the same animals as they are in the as they, as they are in let's say Sasori or women health song or what the other films are are called. And I think in the context of Michael Kaji's career this omission makes sense. I think she left Mikatsu for the reason because mm. they went into the direction of yeah. uh, doing a lot of Roman porno, I think it was, and she yeah. didn't want to uh, go in that direction. So, I mean, it makes sense for the film because it makes it stronger, it makes its message stronger and stand out, but it also makes sense within the career of Michael Kaji. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and it is indeed it, it um, one of the most important things about Lady Snowblood that it is very much an exploitation film, but then it is so much more. There is not just the appeal of sex and violence. The, the film works in a number of levels and is social commentary and uh, a whole of other context there, which we will speak a bit more uh, later on. But uh, for now, I also I wanted to focus on the technical aspect of the film, which is it is impressive to look at, despite the fact that it's so there are so many different scenes, so many different locations, so many different settings. Everything, however, looks impressive, even though the film was shot on a very low budget. Tom? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was shot on a shoestring budget, uh, but I mean, the fact that it's a period piece and the sets look magnificent, like the costuming and everything is fantastic. The special effects during all of the fight sequences, the, you know, kind of glorious blood spurts and stuff, they all work seamlessly. I can't think of any moments actually off the top of my head where it looks a bit silly or, you know, an effect that might look a little bit cheap in uh, similar exploitation films, but... Um, Considering the resources they had and the time that they had as well, they really made a great looking film uh, and it endures. I think the settings also support the, the, the message tremendously. I mean, you have so many period dramas where it is just a setting, like, you know, a setting in a, uh, in a theater play, but here it's very, it has, a, it has a certain meaning. I mean, we're going to comment on the ballroom scene in a moment, but the, the most memorable scene that I can think of is actually at the beginning when you see the birth of Yuki in this prison cell. You have this, it's very gritty, it's, it has this uh, atmosphere of loneliness, of being isolated, mm -hmm. of being left there for dead, basically. But at the same time, it has this uh, feeling of community. You have this community of, of, of women who, um, Who's saying, well, you know, we're, we're trying to live in this, we're trying to live in this society. The least we can do is, um, you know, share this, help each, help each other, help each other out in a certain, in a certain way. Which, by the way, is also a common theme in the 1970s exploitation. If we think of other Michael Kaji films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely the ballroom scene and the one you just described are quite impressive. Uh, the one that stays on my mind, maybe it could be from Kill Bill, but it's the one where the four murderers have, uh, after they hit Sayo, they stand above her looking her, and the camera actually shows the perspective of the victim. I think this is a very impressive scene, which yeah. um, is one of those that uh, Dino took uh, exactly as it was. Tom, impressive scenes. Well, I, to be honest, I think it's a testament to the film that there are so many different scenes that stand out for so many different reasons. I mean, there's the scene where uh, Yuki is, uh, she's tracked down, I believe it's uh, Banzo, and, uh, you know, she's about to enact revenge. Uh, and it's a very kind of moody scene with like the waves crashing in, and there's a lot of sort of atmosphere going on there. Um, but then that's almost in complete contrast to some of the more action heavy scenes where it's all about the spectacle and about like the contrasting colors, you know, like the blood splattering against the snow or like these white walls. And the, the, there are a lot of different styles being employed. And I, again, I just think it's a testament to the filmmaking that they were able to do it again with the budget that they had. I think you know, it's just very creative. Sorry. No, no, no. I want to interrupt. Um, I think another scene that stands out for me with, uh, I'm not sure who it, is, who it is, but it's the one who turned out uh, to be an alcoholic who lives alone, who lives alone with his daughter. His and up. she's making, is it? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And she's making these, um, what is it? She's weaving or something uh, like that. But she's making baskets. Yeah, she's making these large baskets and she keeps up the pre- the pretense that she's selling that she's selling those to make to make a living, which in the end turns out to be a complete lie because she's actually throwing them off of off a cliff and she's selling her body in this in the town, which her father doesn't know about or doesn't want to know about. We don't know that for a fact. But mm. this scene where she throws down the baskets down the cliff, which goes on for quite some time, that it's just a small detail, but it's again it encapsulates so much about um that 
you can't make an honest living here or it's very tough to make an honest living when you are when in this kind of situation if you are not willing to you know sell your sell your body or you know commit a crime or anything yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. indeed indeed um, and also it's easy to say that most of the fighting scenes are quite memorable they're all impressive and uh, it's it's actually yeah it's a testament to how well shot such a film can be you okay many people when they see those films they just focus on the violence and what is happening in that direction but the artfulness is obvious if you can get over the fighting and all the violence and maybe the rape scenes you know they are there but they are just there as a part of the film they're not the whole thing which is much more artful. Yeah, well, I think, I think, especially considering the fact that I'd been putting off seeing this film for so long, I'm not putting it off, but just kind of waiting for the right moment for it. You build up a certain expectation in your head of what it's going to be like, and you kind of hear about why it's uh, so famous, and you know the the violence and the blood and the sort of like edgy plot and the graphic sex and all of this stuff. But I mean that that's not what I've taken away from the film at all. In fact. A, while the fight scenes, I think some of them are beautifully choreographed. Um, they're not the most standout moments for me. Like when I think back on the film, and I think that, that shocked me quite a bit considering what I thought I was getting into and the impression that the film gives you maybe when you see the poster or a trailer or you talk to someone about it for the first time. Um, so yeah, it, it really surprised me how much more there is going on. I think it would also surprise me, which always surprises me when I watch uh, this one and the sequel Lost Song of Endings is how political these films are. I mean, the sequel may be more so than the first one, but um, I think um, I just researched it, the script writer. I, ca I can't remember his name. Maybe Panos or Tom, you can help me out. With uh, this it's thing, Norio Osada. Yeah, he was kind of, he had a history with, he was a member of the Communist Party, I think. Um, at some at some point, or at least he followed left wing politics, and this is very much this very much infuses the script of Lady Snowblood, both the, the first the first part and the and the sequel. And it always surprises me when you look when you compare Lady Snowblood, its sequel, and all the other films of the era too. Let's say exploitation of nowadays that how political these are that is that there is a message in between that it's not so that it's not so much about as we pointed out this earlier, it's not about the sex score or whatever it is that you are exploiting pardon the pun exploiting in your in your film it's about uh, what you want to come across and that's why i think as a period piece lady snowblood works much much better because it has this message these performances and these scenes yeah. Uh, well, indeed, indeed, and it's uh, it's also exceptional the way the presentation of the Meiji era, where the actual story takes place, is excellent. But the fact that uh, the film manages to make a parallel with uh, the actual political situation of Japan during the seventies and the sixties is is also impressive because they were both like, uh, they were both eras of extreme inequalities. For example, the Meiji era essentially signaled the end of the samurai era, which was something for Japan that, that was shattering. It was a whole uh, group of people that were like the leaders of society, the whole samurai caste, caste let's say, that suddenly find themselves being poor and having nothing to do. And at the same time, the merchants, who in the samurai era were considered the lowest of the low, essentially, were now gaining money and gaining power. It's a thing that becomes quite obvious in the film, particularly during the finale. Yeah. Tom? Yeah, I mean, we said we were going to discuss the, uh, the ball sequence, and I do think that's quite significant, just for a number of reasons. Uh, First of all, being that it looks very European. It looks very different to the rest of the film. You know, everyone's wearing suits and dresses. And I think when Yuki turns up, uh, I believe she might be the only person there wearing a kimono, wearing like a traditional garb, you know. Um, 
the fact that it's a masquerade ball as well that's something that's again traditionally kind of a, a european high class society event you know it just shows the foreign influence in the early meiji era um seeping into japan but with it as well i guess the corruption around it because you talk about the merchant class and them kind of gaining more footing i believe uh gishiro who's yuki's final target uh, mm. turns out that he's made his living and he's made his fortune selling weapons despite the fact that in the past he was a criminal and you know he's clearly benefiting from a corrupt society but when we see yuki and i guess her peers and the people that she's kind of depending on for support the levels of poverty are kind of extreme mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i also think it's a stark contrast to uh what from this identity as a japanese film which which you see at the which you see at the beginning and then this well let's say almost decadent a ballroom ballroom scene and I think it also is an, um, when we talk about memorable scene, the scene to me is memorable for its, its execution, but also its play on identity. I remember that uh, Yuki wears a mask or has to wear a mask because, well, it's a mask, it's a masquerade ball. But um, the fact that she wears a mask gives her whole uh, uh, costume the fact that it, look, it looks like a costume that she is wearing. It doesn't look like, hey, this is me, this is Yuki, this is my identity, it looks like a costume. But the moment she takes off the mask, you have this, um, this, this, this confirmation of, uh, of, this, uh, of this identity, which makes her stand out in this whole um, scene and this whole, uh, in this whole ballroom among, among, these, among these people. So yeah, it's, 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 a strong it's a strong contrast to the poverty that is, that is outside. No, I think as well it's worth noting that the, uh, in terms of the significance of the era that the film set, the turbulence of the early Meiji era is, is kind of the catalyst for the story. Because if it wasn't for, um, I think it was a, a revolt that's happening that leads to uh, the incident involving Yuki's mother, that is what kickstarts this whole story of revenge. You know, it, it's just kind of critiquing that or maybe not critiquing, just looking back on that turbulent era and critiquing it in some way. Yeah. Well, and it's obvious that the, the ballroom scene, okay, it's a metaphor, but I think it's quite obvious that uh, Yuki represents something of the old traditional Japan and the rest of the people there, the enemies represent the westernization that started to dominate the country. I think it's obvious, although... I have to say the ending with the flag kind of confuses me. I don't know what signifies Japan is dead or what do you think about the... Okay, let's talk about the finale. It's okay, the film is 40 years old. I guess we can give some spoilers. So... Uh, and again, those people who are watching this, they, they know that. Yeah, probably do. So the final opponent dies hang, uh, hanging to a Japanese flag. What did you think that means was it not Gishiro who falls over the balcony onto the Japanese flag yeah 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 um yeah I mean I like I said I thought it was a a critique of the way that Japan was going at the time because obviously with the modernization they were looking to expand the empire um it, it's a strange one and I was trying to place the film into some sort of historical context um, for the time that it was made. I don't know if it's a critique of the past or what was happening in contemporary Japan as it was being made for there to be criticism of the current government. Um, but I mean, at face value, I just took it as, because uh, I think you'll notice there's, there's an American flag next to the Japanese one that falls that stays yeah. tall. Um, don't know if that's saying something about the post-war occupation and just kind of a, almost a, a premonition in hindsight, if you like, of where Japan was heading, like where that kind of society and that kind of government and ruling was leading to. It's, it's a bit of a, a reach, to be honest. Um, I think you can take it a lot of ways. The fact that uh, Gishiro bleeds all over the flag as well is, you know, it's there's yeah. something there. Yeah, Ruben, what do you think? 
um, to add to the uh, dimensions or the layers that Tom just opened up in to, to the way to read this, I just always read this. I mean, the, the, the Japanese flag is uh, there from the beginning. When you think of snow blood, I mean, the Japanese flag looks like a drop of blood that is on snow. Definitely. So when you, uh, so as a representation of Japan, um, Michael, no, sorry, Yuki represents a sort of a change or a need of change. Um, in that era, you have so many of these lonely male figures. Um, I mean, you, if you think of ja if you think of samurai um, epics, if you think of, for example, Zatoichi or uh, Ito Ogami, you have these lonely figures. But this is, but Yuki represents something, something new especially because she's a female. She, while at the same time, she can be violent as hell and quite gory and and uh, fill, and her eyes filled with disgust when she looks at her enemies. At the same time, she can be so compassionate and so loving. Um, and this sort of stark contrast sort of represents for me a sort of change that needs to, that needs to come. We have to you know, we have to be decisive at the one point. We have to, uh, but at the same time, we don't have, we can't forget this level of empathy, this level of com compassion, which is a sort of dichotomy which plays out um, here, but very much so, as, especially also in the sequel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, occasionally, what, what, may, what this scene with the flags makes me think is like, Okay, maybe I'm going too far with this, but I think that it's like the old Japan, uh, Meiko Kaji is fighting the new Japan, which is the whole thing with the merchants and the whole ballroom scene. And essentially, they both lose, and the one that stands is America. Let's just say that if you think that the whole samurai era uh, was ended force forcefully due to American intervention, the force the Japanese to change, essentially. Maybe this could be perceived as a comment towards that, that the Americans made the old Japan fight, fight the new Japan, and in the end, they were the only ones that stand, remain standing or something like that. Maybe I go too far, but... No, no, I, I think that's actually a really good way to look at that. I haven't yeah. considered that. I think the film is, is definitely sympathetic to the samurai class of the era and of old Japan, just, you know, the way that it, it very much vilifies the uh, upper parts of society. And I think the fact as well, uh, just the details like Yuki not using a gun, whereas some of her enemies do, you know, she still uses the traditional sword or a knife. Um, it's kind of clinging to those old ideals or those old ways when the world around her or the powers that be around her are rapidly modernizing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also another, it's also very interesting the way women are portrayed in the film as in both uh, Yuki and Sayo. Uh, the comments are very interesting there also because okay, Sayo has this tragic event that happens to her in the beginning of the story. And then uh, at the moment that she manages to exact revenge, she's thrown in prison, which seems ridiculous for after what she has suffered. And, uh, okay, let's talk a bit about that. What do you think about the presentation of Sayo as a woman in that era, Ruben? I mean, it uh, has something to, I mean, that's uh, something that, I mean, we're later on going to talk about Michael, Michael Kaji in a bit, let's say, broader context. And uh, I mean, these kind of roles, it's something that she has played out a lot. I'm not going through a whole cinema, uh, a whole uh, body of work at this point, but um, she has played these kind of women who not only uh, are against society or who are outcasts in this society, outcasts by choice, I might add. But um, yeah, but their but their presence or let's say their emp their empathy also leads to a certain sort of um, community within uh, women, but also at the same time, the community within those who are, let's say, disenfranchised, the poor, or let's say those who are, those who are oppressed follow, be follow behind her. And she stands 
for these and this kind of portrayal of women as um, as leaders to some to some point as people who exec execute revenge that's quite that's quite new and i think it's all and i think lady snowblood even though it is an iconic role for michael Kaji and it's an iconic film doesn't get enough credit for this sort of portrayal of of women, which is especially true as a, or especially relevant as a portrayal or as a reflection of the time. If you think of, let's say the whole uh, um, women movement or female movements in the 1960s, 1970s, it's quite relevant there. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I agree to an extent. I'm not too sure about the empathy side of things, the empathetic parts of Yuki's character, which I, believe we'll get into when we talk more about the concept of revenge in the film just in general but in terms of the role of women and uh, what you said about uh, Yuki's mother in particular I think all of nearly all of the women in the film are very much in control of their own destinies uh, they're very much in control of what they're doing I believe that they are the driving force behind their own decisions you know I mean um, just beginning with Yuki's mother when she is sleeping around in prison, essentially, she's doing that of her own accord. It's not like she was, which in other exploitation films may have been different. Uh, her being attacked by guards or something, you know, she's the one choosing to do it because she wants to have a child so that that child can take revenge for her. Um, even one of the villains of the piece, Okano, she's brought herself to quite a high stature in society, the fact that she's got a group of guards sort of like working for her, you know, she's quite a well-respected and wealthy figure. Um, even uh, Kobue, I believe that's how you pronounce her name, I'm not sure. Uh, the uh, daughter who's working as a prostitute, she is choosing to do that and she's taking care of her father in that way. She doesn't seem to have any um, bad feeling about the life choices that she's made in the path that she's taken. Uh, and obviously Yuki is the number one. In fact, out of all of the women, she may be the one who feels least in control of her actions because she's sort of driven solely by this uh, burden of revenge on the part of her mother. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, I, think, I think the way that uh, women are portrayed in the film and their decisive action that they take is quite magnificent. And it's also, I feel that this must have been essentially radical for the era because you have a, a women's prison film which most of the time of what happens in those films is that guards are raping and torturing the inmates but in this case you have Sayo actually using uh, the prison guards to get what she wants to get pregnant which is like it's very radical for such a film she's totally in control even if, if she's in prison even if uh, the, how much in control she is also goes to what you just mentioned about her daughter, that even in her death, she actually controls her daughter's destiny completely. It's, uh, I think it's a very important point about the film, uh, very radical. Uh, the whole point of um, women being victimized doesn't work here. Yeah, um, I mean, we talked about at the very beginning. We talked about the portrayal of sex, of sex, which isn't which isn't present here. But sex is usually a means in exploitation to make that statement that women are being, well, hence the name exploitation, exploited or abused, physically abused most of the time, and male males confirm their status within that society. It doesn't work here because most of these women also the daughter i have already forgotten the name sorry um but more label them as victims it doesn't work that way you can say that they have a certain um dedication or a certain journey which is some which is somewhat tragic in a way but they but it doesn't work to me to see them as victims because of the way they instrumentalize people I mean, at the very beginning, we see Yuki um, dealing with a leader of sort of bandits or something like that, a network of bandits or thieves to get the destination or to get, to get the uh, whereabouts of, of, her of her targets. 
and this makes clear that she's using the same the same powers that her mother did she, the the power of dealing uh, with men on her own terms of not being abused by them yeah 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 definitely the women are not victims in this film it's obvious uh, from beginning okay not from the beginning maybe but after the beginning they are Definitely handling their fate, their fate is in their hands completely. I think it's one of the points of the film. Yeah. Um, and if, if I could very just quickly add, the one instance of where there is a sort of damsel in distress figure that needs saving, it's actually uh, Asayo, the journalist, yeah. uh, Yuki's friend, where he gets captured and she ends up being the one having to save him. It's a complete role reversal of what would be a traditional damsel in distress situation especially the exploitation film where we might see Yuki captured and potentially sexually assaulted and then a male figure have to step in and save the day. It's, it's not present there at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, also important is that this time women are neither portrayed as the object of love of one man. There, there is no romance in the film. Like, um, no women, no woman in the film cares about this thing. The men are just there, either to be maimed or to be used, which is also unusual for okay for the portrayal of women in the era. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go to what do you think about the whole concept of revenge in the film? It's a driving force. Can I, can I add a question to this? Yes. Since Shinji uh, Yuki is set on a quest to revenge uh, the wrongs that um, these four people did to her, her par to her parents, I'm asking myself the same question as I do with all the other films where it's about revenge. Does is the revenge somewhat, you know, some way cathartic in a way, or is the is it a does it bring you peace of mind? I think it's completely the opposite. I think it's obvious that uh, the concept of revenge in this film uh, is uh, a destructive force. It destroys Sayo and essentially destroys her daughter because it puts her in a path that uh, dominates her whole life. She can get away from exacting revenge. This is her purpose, in the, the sole purpose in, in life. I think it's awful the way revenge is portrayed here. I don't know, Tom? No, I, I completely agree. Um, I think revenge is the driving force behind the entire film, but it's never once portrayed in a positive light. Um, I think Yuki's entire characterization is based around this concept of revenge uh, to the point where, I mean, she's told multiple times you have to bury other emotions, you have to bury any feelings of sadness or happiness or love or hate. It's just all about the revenge. And that damages any potential relationships that she could have in the film. Uh, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, there's, there's no love interests because there's no room for love interests, uh, particularly for Yuki. You know, she completely shuts off that side of her. Um, she's solely motivated and I would say burdened by this need for revenge. Um, the first uh, target that she executes in Banzo in my mind, in that moment, she is feeling sympathy for him because at that point, he's quite a pathetic, old, weak figure and he's begging for his life. And you see it. And I think the subtleties in Mike Okaji's performance are fantastic because she lets through those little winces of sympathy before you see her just have to completely cut it out and just get back to, no, I'm here solely for revenge, solely for vengeance. I think it completely chips away at her soul throughout the film and I think that's summed up in you know the very final moments where there's a look about her of what do I do now you know she has no purpose in life come the end of the movie because she's been born and bred solely for the purpose of revenge I think if she takes revenge you have, it's not it doesn't end with these four individuals because in my mind, that's and that's why I think the or maybe Panos has this problem with the ending because it's so it's so open. You you actually she sort of at least that's what I'm getting from the ending. She sort of realized it's not about these four individuals because they were representative of a system, and you basically need to get rid of that system as a means to get revenge. If you want revenge to be you know cathartic to give you peace of mind, you actually have to you know attack 
on a much larger scale, extract your or the, um, execute revenge on a much larger scale in a certain way. And that's what I think makes her so desperate even yeah. in, a, in a way. I mean, that's what that's a good uh, a transition to, let's say, for example, when we see her again in the sequel where she is completely exhausted and desperate or because she has fought her way through so many through so many people and and you get a sort of hint in that in that final moment that's why i think it's sort of a sympathy or empathy uh, even because she un, she understands what she's going through and there is this moment of understanding when she sees the daughter of benzo What's his name? Uh, she sees her again, which, by the way, is something that uh, Tarantino also plays with. She sees her and she she understands uh, because this, the daughter has has att just attacked her. She understands why she did that. She understands that and she sympathizes with it at this point. That's why I think um, what makes her as a uh, as a character so unique this empathy or call it understanding or sympathy and whatever you may feel yeah uh, and i think i i would say uh, a lot of people kind of uh, or i say a lot of people a lot of the stuff that i've read about before the film uh kind of point to the fact that michael kaji and yuki yuki is this very like cold character you know she's like this badass just like quiet assassin type and it's like there's so much more complexity to the character that there's so much more underneath the surface. She's a very tortured individual at the fact that she's having to bury any other feeling other than that of vengeance and, you know, focusing solely on revenge. Um, I, I think it's a bit of a disservice to the character to say that she's just, you know, a, a typical kind of cold, stern assassin type Um and I think that goes, uh, and I think that's that also supports. I mean, we, I think we can now talk about Michael Kaji in, in this in this role, because um, I think Panos in one of your recent reviews, I'm not sure what film it was, you said there is a certain stereotype when it comes to Asian acting that they have that many people think that they don't express emotion enough or they don't express emotions like for example a method actor uh, would would do i'm not sure if it was the if it if i'm quoting you correctly but i think it was some it goes in that direction and that's why i always say have a look at michael kaji whenever there's a person doubting michael kaji does very little she's not that she's not the method actor in a certain in a certain way but when she does something and that's, you know, I find it hard to describe it because there's so much going on in that, in that face of hers, in that expression of hers. Um, that's why you have no Michael Kaji film where there is not at least a dozen of close-ups uh, about with her face or especially her eyes. Um, it has, a, it, it it's encapsulates so much her rage her beauty, this empathy or sympathy, whatever you want to call it. And um, at the same end, it's so, it's so magnificent and it captures so, so much by sometimes doing so very little. And you don't have to do that much because, I mean, the situation which we just described pretty much does it for you. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. Obviously, this is another of the of the best assets of the film. The, the way Meiko Kaji portrays her role is uh, it, it's magnificent. She, she barely speaks in the whole thing, but you can see all this emotion in her. It's obvious. I mean, uh, both the director and the cinematographer. The only thing they have to do is make do a close up to her face, and everything is settled. You can understand what is happening immediately, even if she doesn't speak at all. When I I remember when I saw the film for the first time, I, I would pause the I would pause the video at some points where, where there was a close up in her eyes, and I would really believe that if there was a face to events, you could just put her eyes there and next to the term events, and you would understand what mm -hmm. the thing is all about. Uh, Tom about Meiko Kazi. No, I see. I, I think she's an incredibly brave actress, considering the roles that she took on throughout the exploitation era. She's obviously an icon of that era. Um, 
you know, like I said, despite her sort of cold and detached uh, demeanor at times, there's a lot of subtlety in her performance. She holds back a lot of emotion. Um, she's obviously made the role what it is. Uh, you know, you, you can't, you when you think Lady Snowblood, you think Mekakaji, they're inseparable. You can't picture anyone even coming close to the job that she did with it. And she kind of took those roles, those kind of, women of vengeance and really made them her own you know um which in itself is a huge achievement and i think it's okay not easy but uh, i think it's definitely it's probably her best role from the ones i've seen her in i think is uh, uh i think is the best role that she has played okay so uh Ruben, you want to add anything else about uh, Kazi acting? I think we're... No. No, not that much. I mean, I can I can deliver more praise to the praise that you that you uh, uh, that we have already given, but I think it speaks for itself. I mean, those who th those people who watch Asian or who uh, who watch this and don't know anything about Michael Kaji. I think you're not a film. You're not a fan of Asian films. You should definitely go watch a Lady Snowblood, a Sasori films, films like Retaliation, or and uh, many, 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 many others. These films are great, and they are supported by a phenomenal performance by Michael by Michael Kaji. I mean, in the first a film, I know we shouldn't mention other films so much, but in the first. Um, Stray Cat Rock film. She has a, she's a side character or a minor minor character, but uh, when she is on the screen, you actually notice that because she's actually much better than the, than the girl who is or the actress who's playing the main character. I mean, she's not she's not bad, but she but in comparison to Michael Kaji, she pales, and she is a strong strong presence in every in every film and the way she carries Lady Snowblood, the way she makes us feel the suffering of this character, the tragedy of this character, magnificent. Yeah. And I also think that uh, in Lady Snowblood, uh, I think she was uh, more beautiful than ever. I've seen her in a lot of films and I think this is, she's at the top of her beauty. She's 26 years old and she's like, this is what I wonder to behold, even without the acting, she's extremely beautiful. This is what I feel when I see her. Uh, okay, I guess that's it. Tom, would you like to add anything else? We're set. No, uh, other than I'm just looking forward to discovering more Michael Kaji films. I still need to watch the Lady Snowblood sequel. Um, it's quite difficult to track down. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I highly recommend it. I imagine a lot of the people watching have already heard about it or have watched it themselves already. So if not, you have to. Indeed, indeed. Okay, I guess uh, that's it. Uh, if you like this discussion, uh, you can also sub subscribe to our channel. We're going to do one of these things every week, probably. So, from me, Panos Kodzatanasis, uh, Ruben. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Have a good night and watch some great films. Tom? Take it easy. Okay. Goodbye and see you next week. <laughs>